clinicians uh, working in conflict affected settings with analytical services, uh, and our three panelists, uh, Shukriya Delawar, a peace and security expert, human rights advocate, and gender specialist, who is currently consulting with Humanity United to support the implementation of USAID's localization agenda. Michael Collins, the executive director for the Americas at the Institute for Economics and Peace, IEP, and Suleiman Abdullahi, a peace building and stabilization consultant who has worked for over a decade in East Africa and is currently the Pearl team leader for violence and conflict assessment in Kenya. On behalf of CBP, Pearl and our panelists, thanks uh, so much to all of you for joining and participating today. This session coincides with the upcoming release of USAID's Violence and Conflict Assessment Framework, which replaces the Conflict, Ass Conflict Assessment Framework 2.0 with an updated approach to violence and conflict analysis that reflects years of lessons learned from within USAID and across the community of practice. In addition to revisit revisiting the conceptual approach, approach that USAID uses to analyze and understand dynamics of violence and conflict, the, the violence and conflict assessment framework also integrates learning around how violence and conflict assessments are implemented. This includes a more intentional approach to using localized and participatory processes with partners uh, to ensure conflict analysis can inf effectively inform sustainable and impactful peace building efforts, aligning with USAID's overall localization efforts to put local actors in the lead, strengthen local systems, and ensure development work is responsive to local communities. At the same time, uh, while we as peace building donors, practitioners, analysts, um, local stakeholders, often agree that localized and participatory approaches are not only valuable, but necessary. Uh, and in fact, localization priorities are not new to USAID or the broader sector. It's also clear that there are continued challenges and barriers around how we can best design and implement these approaches in practice and adapt the way we're working. As CVP begins piloting the violence and conflict assessment framework through Pearl, we want to use this opportunity in this session to actively engage on several core questions that can inform how we will in implement USAID's updated approach. First, how can USAID's approaches to conflict analysis best incorporate, leverage, and support local partners in analyzing violence and conflict? And second, what are some of the key practices that USAID traditional implementing partners and local partners can adopt to enable meaningful two-way engagement with local actors on violence and conflict assessments. To encourage discussion around these questions, each of our three panelists is going to share some reflections on the challenges and successes they've experienced with localizing approaches. After each panelist shares their reflections, we'll have 15 minutes uh, for questions, reactions, discussion uh, with the wider audience. We really want this to be an interactive session where we, as the organizer of the session, give you an opportunity as the audience to feed in and share your experiences. So we really encourage everyone to turn on your camera wherever that's possible, participate in the discussion by raising your hand um, using the, the Zoom feature during the time we have for the discussion. So we can call on you and bring you off mute and make use uh, of the chat function at any time during the session. And we'll make sure questions and contributions are incorporated in the discussion. Just one housekeeping note, um, as always, please remember to keep your microphones off after you've finished making a contribution or while others are speaking. And finally, for those who haven't done so yet, please do introduce yourselves in the chat function, tell us your name, where you're joining from, and if you're up for it, give us a brief thought on what interested you in joining today's session. Without further ado, Shukriya, over you to start us off on the discussion. Thank you, Sophie, and I wanna thank USAID, CPS, CVP, and Pearl for organizing this discussion, and I'm delighted to take part in it. Um, so, First slide, <laughs> I will be talking about very recent research. I'll say this is just over the last uh, month uh, 
but as Sophie mentioned, I'm consulting with Humanity United and I am helping them support um, an MOU effort uh, between USAID and Humanity United. Next slide, please. So just recently an MOU was signed between USAID Center for Conflict and Violence Prevention and Humanity United. Uh, my desk research and future consultations with peace builders and USAID staff will aim to support the localization agenda. I'll be doing this through a series of consultations and I hope uh, the members in the audience, anyone who's interested in um, engaging in this effort, uh, I welcome it and I will put my email in chat in a little bit and please just drop me an email and I'll be happy to include you because over the next several weeks and months, I will share some highlights right now of the research, but it is really uh, designed in a qualitative way where we're actually talking to local peace builders and really getting nuances. And I hope today's conversation will also support that. Next slide, please. So the goal of localization, um, as said in 2021 by USAID Administrator Samantha Power, when she announced the policy was to shift power and resources to local actors enable more locally-led development, and create stronger, more sustainable partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. And here are some you know, broad stroke strengths from early research, and I expect to find so much more, but this is just the forum sharing now. USAID has recognized the importance of building meaningful partnerships with local peace builders. USAID has provided capacity building support, and I'll say that's ongoing in several uh, missions to local peace builders. USAID's grant-based funding approach allows local peace builders to respond to changing needs and dynamics on the ground, giving locals more flexibility and autonomy. And USAID is invested in more staff with relative, relevant expertise. And this is also a challenge, yet also an ongoing effort to address that issue. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the challenges. The power dynamics can be a challenge in partnerships between USAID and local peace builders. Um, it's important that um, there, there's limited capacity and resources of local actors and organizations. While local actors and organizations may have a deep understanding of the local context, they may lack the capacity and resources to implement effective uh, development and peace building interventions without adequate support. Uh, USAID's bureaucratic processes can also impede that effort and create delays and limit the flexibility of local peace builders. And then there's a challenge of limited funding, which may reduce the scale and impact of local peace building efforts. Um, I also want to say that um, greater cultural sensitivity and understanding is required uh, by all donors, not just USAID, but um, all international donors. And that really comes with time and, and building relationships with local trusted partners that can help them navigate the different uh, realities on the ground. Next slide, please. So some recommendations, and these are early, and I, I, <laughs> I know I'm going to have local peace builders really enhance this part, but um, it, it's it. In, in, in the bigger effort, it's it's sort of stating the obvious, but ensure that local peace builders have a meaningful voice in decision-making processes. This is easier said than done because sometimes there are security situations in country that, some, that becomes difficult to do. Um, review bureaucratic processes to identify ways that could reduce delays and increase flexibility. And prioritize funding for local peace building efforts and ensure accessibility to a diverse range of local actors. Uh, that last bit also comes with the caveat of uh, vetting local peace builders because every local peace builder is not the same. Every local organization is not the same. There's uh, sometimes organizations put up, as we all know, that are corrupt or led by uh, political alliances or have warlords behind them. So there's all kinds of issues, but it is important that funding local peace builders and providing that accessibility with trusted partners that can vet other local peace builders become a greater effort. Next slide, please. And then this is the part where I'd really like some engagement. So to really help my efforts in the coming weeks uh, and months, 
Uh, I just want to pose this question to the audience and I'm all ears. How can USA enhance the engagement with local peace builders and address current challenges? And how can USA and or other donors more equitably engage local knowledge assets and practices and align programming with local priorities and metrics for success? I'll stop there and thank you, Sophie. Great, thank you so much, Shukriya, for sharing these really insightful reflections um, from some of your research. I think some of the points you've outlined, um, you know, in addition to the questions you put on the slide for engagement, also provide another helpful starting point for our discussion, um, which is around some of those key barriers and challenges um, that you found um, facing our efforts to localize our approaches. Um, and some initial thinking with the recommendations on how we can start to address these. Um, I want to pause there and open it up um, a little bit to the audience for questions, pre preliminary reflections um, on Shukriya's presentation. You know, um, does anyone want to start sharing responses to these questions um, from their perspective and experience? Great. Well, then I'll probably start with my own questions for you, Shakriya. Um, I know you're. You said that you're early on in the research. Um, one of the key uh, challenges you mentioned was around power dynamics, and I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit what you mean by this, um, what you're seeing through your research, um, and what this has looked like in practice. Sure. Um, so I can reflect on the research and also on personal experience. Uh, when we're, when USAID or any other international uh, donor goes into a country, especially when there isn't already built partnerships and it's like a new mission, uh, and if you add security challenges to that, it becomes really difficult. Like a lot of times you'll see USA just put the grants out and from there there's the lessons learned, right? Because you'll learn, okay, who is the trusted um, local partner? Who is the one that used the funds properly? Who actually was able to report the way reporting requirements were? Um, and then I think a lot of times USA spends that initial phase and really building the capacity of local peace builders, which, which is needed in a lot of contexts. But I think some of the challenge in, in the power dynamic comes from when you're new on the ground and you don't have those um, trusted partnerships, you you can, with all good intention, end up um, funding the wrong orgs and, and actually causing more imbalance. So some of the way to go into that, it's tough, right? But I think there has to be engagement with local peace builder, building the relationship before putting the grants out, unless it's INGOs that you already have relationship with because of other missions that you can initially support and get the local peace builders engaged through them, vetted through them because they've been on the ground longer. Uh, but in, eventually you want to make sure that the procure in that design and approach of the, um, in the design and approach of your program, you have actually asked the INGO that after a certain amount of time, if the local peace builder is reporting well, is doing the good work, is vetted, the trust is built, that, that the, the sustainability of that project then depends on transferring that to the local peace builders. So I think often the friction between local peace builders is, okay, we've been on the ground 15 years, the INGO comes in, they get trusted first with more funds, and they've been, the local NGOs have been doing the work now. I understand like smaller grants are easier to give out that way and it makes sense, but with after a certain amount of local NGOs and local peace builders doing that work, I think the expectation from them, which is what I've been hearing even in the last session is we want something in that contract that says eventually that should be handed over to the local orgs. Otherwise there's a disconnect. And especially when you have to pull out of a country uh, for different reasons, then the sustainability of that project because the INGOs also leave because the staff come under security threats. The sustainability of that project just falls apart despite best efforts, right? USAID went in, funded, built the capacity, but then the project falls apart. I know that's a very long uh, answer to your question, but I tried to reflect on research and experience. Thanks. 
No, that's great. Thank you, Shukriya. We also have a question from Michelle. Um, Michelle, are you happy to come off mute and, and tell us a little bit? I think you have two questions now in the chat um, and ask them directly. Sure. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm just curious, we're kind of using this, this term peace builders, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about who is included in that group. Um, and I, I suspect that we all perhaps uh, have different ideas um, and thoughts on that. So I'd be curious to, to hear more about that. And I'm also wondering, you said that one of the recommendations was to ensure that local peace builders have meaningful voices in decision-making processes. And I just wonder what that would look like. You know, what are those processes? And I'm guessing, um, Shukriya, that that goes to this question that you posed about how can we engage, enhance um, engagement with local peace builders. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. That's an excellent question. Um, so where I'm thinking now, and I know this is going to expand and enhance in the coming weeks and months as I engage with local peace builders, um, this initial, I'm at the initial desk research uh, stage and that itself is going to be built. But when I'm thinking about local peace builders, I'm thinking about, okay, the human rights advocates, uh, people involved in mediation and whether that's local community or national level reconciliation efforts. Um, I'm thinking about journalists that, that you know, speak truth to power. I'm thinking about humanitarian aid. Uh, there's so many actors that come in because building the peace is not just about security, right? Building the peace is about making sure that you're allevi alleviating hunger. You're actually building programs, seeing what the, the local environment requires, you know, just really looking, going into a community and asking them, what is your need instead of assuming you know their need, right? So it's that that's also how you can have meaning, meaningful engagement by before you put out exactly what you're looking for, you should actually consult the locals, uh, whether that's bringing them into the mission or, or if the security allows to go and speak to them on the ground and hold these consultations. It's important to before you put out uh, grants to find out first, okay, what is the need of this community? What are they saying their need is? And, and work from their design and, and then engage them in the design of that project so that it is sustainable over time. Um, so there's there's just really a lot in that question, Michelle, and, and, and it's a very important question, but I'll say that I'm still trying to answer it and that answer is going to be built over the next six months. So I'll stop there, thanks. One of the questions, you know, just thinking about the the core question we have for today's session around um, USAID's approach to conflict analysis um, and some of that engagement piece, Shukriya, I was wondering, um, you know, are there any important takeaways so far from your work, you know, specific to conflict analysis and assessments and the way that we engage actors in these specific types of processes? Um, so I think it's important before we go in any country and give out funds to know something about its history, its culture, its politics, the actors, their backgrounds, what's happened, you know, so I, I think the initial part is really doing your own homework before you go into a country. Then it's building those relationships that become integral to help you navigate all of the nuances that's really impossible to do from Washington, right? So you might want to reach out to your regionals that know the region more, that know that particular conflict better, and really engage in-house experts first. There's also always diaspora experts that can help support a conflict assessment. But eventually, you actually have to go on the ground and engage with locals, because unless you're there and your eyes and ears and you speak to different actors and you build those relationships, you will miss a lot. And I've seen this over and over and over as a as a person who worked four years, the last four years on atrocity prevention efforts. Um, it, it really the 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 responsibility is actually tremendous on the donor. Um, and I don't. Uh, I don't envy it, honestly, but but it is only by actually taking all those measures and really listening and being humble and not projecting what you think needs to happen, but what the local community thinks will lead to peace and supporting and designing your intervention 
in that style. I'll stop there, thanks. I wonder, Michael and Suleiman, I know we'll both have ample opportunity to hear a little bit more from the two of you, um, but whether I can direct that same question at the two of you in terms of, you know, that preliminary question of, you know, what does that engagement around conflict analysis specifically look like? How do we do this uh, meaningfully to encourage, um, you know, good conflict analysis that is able to inform programming? Um, Michael, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sophie. And I was thinking about, I was thinking, oh, how would I answer that question? <laughs> so I have been thinking about it. And there's one, one thing that kind of sort of strikes me as clear, at least um, based on, on our perspective. And that is that number one, I completely agree with, with Shukri, as I'm sure we, we all do, that that due diligence and that detailed analysis of the, of the, the conflict historically and culturally is key, right? Before, before even kind of sort of, you know, doing your, your first form of, of outreach. But at the same time, oftentimes the actual, you know, while trying to localize the, um, the process of conflict analysis, that can also actually, you know, rekindle, right? And create additional tensions as well. One of the things that we've had most success with is rather than conducting conflict analysis or working with communities to undertake their own conflict analysis, number one, oftentimes they've already got their conflict analysis in their mind. Um, number two, the, 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 the most important thing for us is actually more, more of a context analysis in terms of what opportunities there are to build peace. And you know, you're very much kind of sort of flipping the coin because oftentimes when you're going with a conflict analysis frame, it's about looking back and pointing to who was the person responsible. And that leads to, to conversations that, that oftentimes don't go anywhere. Um, but looking at it from a forward thinking perspective as to where we are today and what are the things that we think that we can achieve from here onwards, peace building perspective. And I, I very much get the, the, the question about what do we call peace builders as well. Um, but in this case, individual community uh, members and community groups, that tends to be a lot more productive for, for, for us. So I'd probably say, actually, from a conflict analysis perspective, of course, the key stakeholder interviews are key to inform that macro analysis and should always be done. But the participatory process is, is fraught with challenges. And we've had a lot more success focusing on where we are today and, uh, and what we can do moving forward. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point and hopefully one we can pick up in in some of the the next panels around um you know localization is often seen as a an intrinsic good but how do we do these things with intent and um you know while keeping broader risks in the context in mind um you know meeting different stakeholders where they are um, so I think these are these are questions we can also talk about in some of the next panels. I'm conscious of time um, and think, Michael, we should move on to your panel. Yeah, absolutely, Sophie. Thank you. And I think that you're managing the slide. So if you'd like to jump into to, to the next slide, that would be really great. Um, from, from my perspective, what I'm going to try and do is kind of sort of start from the, the, the global, uh, but then I'm going to drill down and I'm going to bring it down to, to the local and I'm going to end with, with an example that hopefully shows how, how most, if not all, context analysis is something that, that, that can uh, be led um, by the local communities that we're aiming to support in any way we can. Um, but to do that, I do need to start with kind of sort of a global and, and very quickly, I, I work for the Institute for Economics and, and Peace. Uh, think tank based out of Sydney, Australia. I work in the New York office. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to shifting the world's focus to peace as a positive, tangible, and achievable measure of human well-being and progress. Uh, we produce our flagship report is called the Global Peace Index, which is a measure of peacefulness um, around the world. Next slide, uh, please, Sophie. Um, probably the, the easiest way of summarizing all of the work that we try and do and how this connects with the conversation that we're going to have today is that we try and sort of answer these two questions. Number one, what are the world's most peaceful countries through something like the Global Peace Index, for example, but even more importantly, what do they have in common, right? The idea is that if we understand what makes peaceful countries tick, we can aim to replicate those qualities or elements in societies of our own, uh, independently of, of how um, peaceful they, they may be. Just for context, the United States right now ranks in the bottom half of the Global Peace Index by far. So this is by no means uh, a Western or American perspective. Please, Sophie, the next uh, the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, those two questions correlate quite closely with a, a few terms that a number of you will probably be very, very familiar with, this idea of negative peace and positive peace. So negative peace being the absence of violence or fear of violence, which is actually something that it's complex to measure because there's always a lack of data, um, but conceptually it's easy to understand. Countries with low levels of violence, low levels of crime can be seen to have high levels of peacefulness. But the underlying question, this one about, okay, well, what creates and sustains peaceful societies is one that we explore through positive peace. And the way that we do that is we take the results from the Global Peace Index. When we cross-reference those, we do run statistical analysis to see what are the underlying socioeconomic and attitudinal factors that show a statistical correlation. In other words, that when they improve on one side, we see a subsequent improvement uh, in the other in terms of peacefulness. Now, we never talk about causality. We always talk about correlation. And invariably, it's a whole variety of components. In fact, there's over 500 different indicators that we see hold that correlation. And through further statistical analysis, we can see that countries that are highly peaceful or becoming more peaceful have, broadly speaking, the following eight characteristics. Sophie, please. Which we call the eight pillars of positive peace, the ones that you can see here on the left-hand side. Now, thankfully, they're quite intuitive, which is a validation of, of, of the work that uh, a, a lot of us are, are trying to do. We can rest assured that on many cases, we're very much at least trying to do the right um, thing. But again, this is very much from a data-driven perspective, looking at very specific metrics. So in a sense, you know, when we do all of our local workshops and have our local conversations, we always start from this global perspective as well, because it allows people to see this isn't something that we sort of pulled out of our sleeve, so to speak. One of the probably most interesting things here um, is that these, these countries, right, countries with high levels of positive peace, countries that do well in each of these individual pillars, benefit from a whole other variety of things over time. And this includes countries that are improving in positive peace as well. So higher per capita income, higher levels of resilience to natural disasters, uh, pandemics like COVID-19, for example, better environmental outcomes, and they perform better on development goals and even higher measures of well-being as well. Sophie, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So, you know, trying to find ways of being able to sort of simplify this, this analysis, and I'm bringing it around to sort of the monitoring evaluation perspective to a degree, we produce a positive peace index. So because of the statistical analysis and because it's all data driven, we can actually, you know, create indices and rankings to be able to ascertain which are the countries that have these underlying characteristics, which are the ones that are improving in these underlying characteristics, and which are the ones that are not. Next slide. Sophie. Now, one of the interesting things here, and I'm going to get more local in a minute, I promise, um, is it enables us to be able to look at, say, differences between the Global Peace Index, where a country is right now in terms of its overall level of peacefulness, for example, versus where it is with these underlying attitudes, institutions, and structures that create and sustain peace. And on occasions, what you would find is you would find a country that has a relatively high level of peacefulness now, but is lacking this underpinning and therefore is likely to deteriorate in peace. So, for example, here's um, a, a sort of a, an analysis that we completed looking back, um, showing that nearly 80 percent of the countries that had a positive peace deficit in 2009 deteriorated in peacefulness within the following 10 years. Now, of course, it's never an exact science. You can't always point to specific uh, countries, Ukraine, for example, is a country that wasn't on this list. But, for example, as you can see here, Syria, Libya, and this is all pre-Arab Spring, Burkina Faso, Yemen, uh, uh, Haiti, a variety of others are. So, for example, if moving forward, we can then sort of do a, a certain degree of predictive analytics. Sophie, could you move to the next slide, please? These would be some of the examples of countries that currently have a very large positive peace deficit. In other words, for the most part, they're relatively high in peacefulness or medium scale, I should say. But what they do have is they do have significant lackings in the underlying elements that create and sustain peace. Next slide, Sophie, please. So we do a lot of our research at the national level, and that's because where it's where most of the data exists, right? Um, you know, National Statistics Office, there are significant gaps around the world as well, but they're also a good source of information. But in any nation, you can put that information together and get a, you know, global assessment of peacefulness, which again is something we do through a global Positive peace, these eight pills of positive peace that we talked about before, from a city perspective, or a town perspective, or a community perspective, because each of these individual social systems interact together, and they all go towards creating 
the whole. So what applies at a level of uh, at the nation state applies equally within these smaller social systems. So this is when we sort of start to see the outline of a practical tool for, for communities to be able to themselves build, peace, conduct their own context assessments. Sophie, next slide, please. Thank you. And you're doing it very well, by the way. Thank you. So um, in terms specifically of the participatory uh, analysis using positive peace, and you know, I think one of the core themes of the of the panel was was you know what can be driven by local data organizations and sources. So I'm going to share a very specific example of a workshop that we very recently completed. Uh, next slide, please, Sophie. Um, and the reason I, I selected this one, uh, although the outcomes of that and the engagement is still ongoing, is that our local partner on the ground was called Funda Now they're, they're a very, very, very small organization in rural Colombia. Um, but through a 18 month collaboration with NYU, for example, have been conducting hundreds and hundreds of interviews with social leaders, reintegrated FARC members, also active FARC members still fighting up in the hills to be able to ascertain their views on the Colombian peace process and the peace accord. They produced a 500 page report with significant amounts of data that then contributed towards the Columbia Truth Commission. So this is a beautiful example of an extremely small foundation doing amazing, amazing research and quantitative work in Colombia. And I'm sure there are many more around the world. But anyway, if you could, if you could scroll through this a bit, I think perhaps there are a couple of other things popping up in relation to the workshop, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. In terms of uh, some of the, the uh, participants in this, including victims of the conflict as well. Next slide, please, Sophie. Great. So how would kind of sort of something like the positive peace framework be used in this particular context? Um, Sophie, could I see the next slide? These are just some images, I believe. That's the one coming up of, of the workshop. The workshop is quite similar to workshops that maybe you facilitated or alternatively workshops that you've attended, but I just wanted to give you a sense. Uh, these were all people who previously didn't know each other at all, all from Southern Colombia, like I say, a mix of social le leaders, reintegrated FARC guerrillas known as Fernandez de Paz, uh, religious leaders, victims associations, etc. Um, let me move to the next slide that has sort of some of the exercises that we work through during this time. So this is in terms of these participatory consultations. Again, it's not even consultations. This is actually design led by the local community. What is it that they would like to do? So very simple questions that you can ask in relation to the pillars of positive peace that we talked about before. Who are the key stakeholders in each pillar? Who are the people, for example, that should we get ourselves together and want to really find ways of meaningful, meaningfully building positive peace in the area of good relations with neighbors or acceptance of the rights of others or a sound business environment in our context, in the size of our community. Bear in mind that, you know, a town like Alcacitas, which is where the training was held, is a town of 35,000 people. So it's a very good place to start. What does uh, well-functioning government mean within this particular context? So here you're already creating kind of sort of a list of people that you want to make sure that you have at the table. So you're doing this from a practical perspective, right? Not a moral perspective of inclusivity or whatever the case, it's practical. It's like, look, we need people who understand um, things in these particular pillars to participate. One of the really interesting outcomes here, and I, I realize I'm kind of sort of delving into this a bit too much, please feel free to, to give me a time check, Sophie. Um, but one of the key things here, for example, is that when they did this analysis themselves, they realized that the consejos de paz, the councils of peace, were one that popped up on all of these different lists. So this gave them the idea for the first time, really, that this particular entity that was created considers to be tremendously under-resourced in Colombia was great to be able to, you know, lead a systemic approach to peace building purely through this exercise. Other questions like what are the community strengths in each pillar? This is by no means IEP or any facilitating organization are deciding this. This is uh, in this case, these social leaders themselves, what are the most notable needs? What are the most notable strengths? And then progressively, what are the pillars that should focus on? So once you've been able to prioritize areas um, or particular pillars you would like to focus on um, as a group, as a municipality, as a USAID office or an embassy, for example, right? What pillars would you focus on and what activities should take place? And then using some of these positive peace concepts that emanate from the research that we do, how can the project activities benefit and consider every one of these pillars? Great, next slide, please, Sophie, thank you. And uh, we are running up a little bit against time for the discussion. So I think um, one minute and then we'll, we'll wrap up and, and open it up to questions. 
Absolutely. So very quickly, what does this like look like on a slightly larger scale? Um, this is a, an ongoing initiative that's been going on for eight, ten years now in Culiacán, Sinaloa, Mexico. Uh, in this case, a local foundation adopting the Positive Peace Pillars to be able to look at all of the different foundations and smaller grassroots organizations that they support from a systemic perspective and making sure that their support um, uh, basically is, is trying to know all of the pillars of positive peace. Next slide, Sophie. I very much believe it's the last one. Oh, it's not. Okay, let's. we're going to have to scroll, scroll through these. I'm very sorry. Please scroll through. These are just some of the results from the training in terms of how capable uh, people felt of using positive peace as a context uh, uh, an analysis tool, uh, as well as to develop social impact projects and even make recommendations for other people as well. Um, please uh, go ahead, Sophie. And please go ahead. Yes, what are the benefits for us, so to speak, right? What are the benefits for USAID? Well, invariably, these kind of process allow us to be able to have much deeper appreciation of the context relating again to the, to the things that Shukriya mentioned, it helps identify new opportunities for engagement that we're not thinking about, that other people are thinking about, and it allows us to be able to leverage better local capacity, of course. And all of these things, by extension, have a positive peace impact on subsequent monitoring and evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you for succinctly summing up the, the m &E portion of the presentation um, in one minute. That was uh, very impressive. Um, I want to, you know, use your presentation where you talked about a specific instance in which, um, you know, you saw uh, participatory analysis work really well, um, and flip that that question and turn it back to the audience. Um, I think we'd really love to hear a little bit from audiences about, you know, what are some of these examples of successes from your experiences uh, working with local partners, whether you are a local partner or you're an implementing partner or a donor. Um, and you know, how can we then draw from some of these experiences um, you know, about like what makes these kinds of participatory analyses a success? How can we replicate these in more contexts where we're working in? I think just to get us started. Uh, Michael, we have a question from Claire in the chat. Um, Claire, do you want to come off mute and and um, raise your question? Yeah, sure. Um, and sorry if my dog is barking in the background. Um, so yeah, I'd just love to hear a little bit more, Michael. I mean, I, it was really helpful to see the types of questions you were asking um, workshop participants and some of the topics um, that were discussed, but I guess I'd love to hear maybe about some of the challenges you faced um, in these workshops in terms of um, really getting that open and meaningful engagement from um, different actors in the room and how you've addressed some of those challenges. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Claire. And, and I'm delighted to say that, well, I mean, of course, there are always challenges and, and a lot of them are individual. Actually, a very interesting one here. Actually, I'll use it as an example. Um, First of all, let me say, though, that thankfully, one of the things that we see through the positive peace framework is, number one, because it's data data driven, um, free, to, free of bias to the extent that that's possible, and because it's forward thinking, right? Um, it, 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 for us, it functions tremendously well as not only an analysis tool, but also a tool for creating social cohesion. So we have, we have at, you know, done positive peace workshops and consultations like this throughout the world uh, and have had uh, uh, no challenge in terms of accepting work and how we use it. What I would say, though, is, for example, um, you do want to be careful, at least based on my personal experience, about when it is presented. So, for example, you know, there are situations in, in which people are tired, and, I, and, I, and I'm summarizing grossly here, and, and, and I apologize, but there are situations in which people are tired of being victims, and they say, listen, I'm tired of talking, I'm tired of being a victim. I want to figure out what is it that we need to do, right? So they come, they would come to an exercise like this with this mindset of trying to figure out solutions. If you approach it too early and somebody has not been listened to, right, it turns into a situation of, no, listen, don't talk to me about this until you have listened to me, right? Until you have heard my, my trauma and until you do hear my trauma, don't speak to me about what is it that we can do next. So one does need to be very careful about when is the right time to, to uh, approach this. But 
um, in this specific case of Columbia, just to show you how well this actually functions. Um, one of the reintegrated uh, FARC uh, guerrillas from Mantis Bath that came, came with six bodyguards and two land cruisers. One of the social leaders um, uh, came with another set of bodyguards. Now, each of these people are threatened by current members of the FARC. Technically, the bodyguards aren't supposed to be there. One bodyguard was there, took a photo, and the social leader asked us to stop the training because that photo could have easily made itself up, in, up into the mountains and they would have been at risk and we would have all been at risk. Um, but through that, through um, we stopped the training, we made a decision, we deleted the photos we talked about it, and the training progressed. The point I'm trying to make here is that these were people who are radically on the different end of the spectrum, right? One was a victim who was currently under threat. One was a former reintegrated FARC guerrilla who was now subject to revenge, you know, the threat of revenge killing. Um, but even so, they were able to work together and, and work very productively uh, on this during and after the workshop. Great. Thank you, Michael. Joan, um, I see that you have your hand up. Would you like to come in? Sure. Yeah. For some reason, um, I can't write uh, I'm, I'm chat message. It just goes to direct message, but then it goes to no one. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for, for this presentation. Uh, I'm Joan with uh, Humanity United. Um, so I, I was, you know, this really... Um, this brought back up memories of me, like with my previous organization I was working with, we were collecting, um, you know, we were surveying a, a community in in Burundi. And so, you know, it was like a baseline kind of survey. And one of the questions, you know, uh, with many questions, um, one of the questions was like this question about um, safety and security. Like, do you feel safe in your, you know, in, in, in your village, in your community? And because there were members of the lo local authority there that accompanied um, mm -hmm. our partners who were doing the survey, you know, everybody was like, yes, of course, you know, and, <laughs> and so five years later, you know, after, you know, after we had done the, the program and parts of that were a lot of um, self-empowerment, you know, livelihoods programs. And so people were more honest, you know, in answering the, the same set of questions. And so we were looking at our data and it's like, wait, after five years, they feel less safe <laughs> because they were more honest, you know? Um, and so instead of feeling more safe after our, the implementation of our program, people were actually feeling less safe. So it, it's so then we had to kind of like tell the story of that instead of saying like, you know, this is the data, but the data is not always right you can't trust the data because of the the kind of context that that um the, the community members that the communities were dealing with so i think i you know for me i just wanted to kind of to share that um i don't really have a a, a question but it, i just wanted to share that story and um just say that i appreciate this kind of analysis this data collection and really socializing data with partners and communities uh so that communities actually you know understand what it is that um you know like the, the information or the data or the information that we are we are gathering um yeah but thank you yeah that that's that's excellent thank you thank you very much Don. and, and i couldn't agree right as with mediation and the, the people in the room there needs to be a certain you know that there can't be too much of the power imbalance because of course then 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 you get what you have so so to a certain degree that selection of of, uh, of participants is, is is important, but also again, you know that focus on the negative component, right? The safety component. The the good thing, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm rambling on about the positive peace framework as a, as a good thing, but it's been purely in terms of, of of my experience is that it also offers a variety of different opportunities to engage in different topics of conversation. So rather than being very narrowly focused on security, for example, right, or insecurity in this case, it provides a much broader spectrum. Um, so thank you very much for that, John. Sophie, can I say one more thing? Very, very, very quickly. Um, we've got something exciting down the pipeline. I see a number of partners from DT Global who, who are joining us that we're hoping to collaborate with DT Institute on. And this is actually a survey tool um, uh, leveraging positive piece that we hope to make available to the international community, um, specifically in terms of trying to establish what's the peace building effectiveness of an active project, right? Relatively simple questions, for example, such as how much do you think 
that uh, this project has contributed to this particular pillar of positive peace? Or alternatively, how much do you think external factors have contributed? And do you think external factors have contributed more or less to what the project has in this particular pillar? Because you're asking all of these questions through these, these eight different pillars, you can then develop a very good systemic understanding of how uh, much, um, you know, how, how responsible the project for improving peacefulness in the community, at least from a community per uh, perceptions perspective. I think, Michael, we have time for one more question, and there's a question in the in the chat. Um, Abiola, do you want to come in and, and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. So my question is basically on um, what do you do? Like, have you ever faced, uh, have you ever been to a community where the, you face the challenge of the locals not opening up to resolution, not even talking, like they don't even want you there, and in such instances, what was done or what do you think can be done to help them more? Thank you. Thank you, Aviola. Um, it, it's it's a difficult one. I mean, I, I say no, but that's that's simply because I haven't necessarily been in those contexts. You know, where we're we're very lucky to have always been essentially, you know, invited either by uh, the community themselves or alternatively. Um, you know, the, a local partner representative of, of, of the community uh, at times that are kind of sort of deemed to be, to be right. So that's something that we're all careful. We, we by no means, you know, parachute into situations that, 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 that we, um, you know, that would kind of sort of be like this. Uh, we are exploring, however, and we do think that there's tremendous potential in using the Positive Peace Framework as a mediation tool. But the mediation process, which is one that you're referring to, uh, to here, uh, specifically, specifically between you know warring warring parties, right, where there is where it's ongoing crisis, is 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 complex. I do think that what the positive peace framework does is again allow the opportunity for people from different sides to be able to better explain their, their interests, right, and to be able to present their their interests in this case in eight different ways. And oftentimes, what we think is driving the position. Uh, of someone that we're trying to to reach an agreement with or we're trying to stop fighting with um, isn't reflected in their position, but in their interests behind that. Uh, and they may be education related or they may be uh, health related or they may be they may be security related, right? But being able to further unpack that uh, is some so, uh, something that we're going to continue to explore. And I think there's potential there too. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um... Just for time purposes, we're going to move um, to our last panelist, Suleiman Abdullahi. Um, Suleiman, are you able to connect? I know you've been having some some issues with the with internet. Uh, Sophie, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm able to connect, but uh, my bandwidth is a little bit low, so I'll just uh, apologize for not having my my video on. But I think you'd rather hear from me than see me anyway. So uh, so I hope that's okay. And it's good to see some uh, a, a really good number of familiar faces uh, and names on this uh, on this uh, on this session uh, today. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for having me. Uh, just as I was hearing uh, Michael and and, and Shukriya speak, uh, I thought that I'd start by making what might be a, a bold statement, but I think uh, many of you might agree with. Uh, I think we all are familiar now with what localization means, uh, but I think more importantly also. We are all, uh, you know, in, in 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 some different ways or forms, practitioners either in conflict prevention or peace building. Um, and I would like to think that, you know, the subject matter expertise that peace building practitioners and conflict prevention uh, experts bring to the localization discourse is actually so integral because no one understands uh, the importance of, you know, localizing and you know, uh, conflict resolution or peace building more than anyone that works in this sector. And so, what do I mean by that? Um, we have seen over and over again from experience that, you know, peace will only take root and conflict will, you know, uh, subside only when the local stakeholders decide that it will. Um, and, and even when we've seen, you know, uh, uh, agreements that have been either, you know, imposed or encouraged by international partners, uh, you know, evidence shows that that usually doesn't tend to hold. And so I would like to, you know, remind you know the stakeholders the participants on this on, on this session that uh, as we think through the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis let's also think through uh what lived experience or you know uh, or, or or practical experience that we bring 
specifically from this field to the wider uh, localization uh, discourse. Um, I spoke at a session uh, last year where I mentioned those examples. Um, you know, with, with peace building and conflict prevention, one of the principles that we've learned now is unless you're inclusive about who's in the room and you're absolutely, uh, you know, determined to make sure that everybody that needs to be in the room is in the room, then you're not going to have a successful outcome. Now, that's exactly what localization is asking us to do as well. It's about thinking through power structures and equitable access to, you know, uh, these venues and forums where important decisions are being made, where needs are being prioritized, where solutions uh, are being are being developed. And if we don't have absolutely everyone in that room, then localization doesn't doesn't succeed. Uh, the second principle is, you know, thinking through the fact that, you know, nuance and context is so important. And I think Shukriya spoke about that. Um, and the challenge then that we have is recognizing that, yes, you know, there's no one size fits all approach uh, to, to the work that we do. Yet at the same time, uh, you know, the challenge that institutional donors and also international partners usually have is we are trying to standardize as much as possible and to try and streamline our approaches. And so finding that happy balance, that medium between, you know, recognizing that, you know, some of these conflicts and, you know, are hyper local. Uh, and, and 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 the context is so different, you know, disparately different. Uh, yet at the same time, we're trying to find you know common frameworks of approaching these, and 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 that's the struggle of making, uh, you know, making sure that localization can work. We recognize that this is not the first attempt by USAID, for example, to try and you know um, work through this uh, you know localization uh, localization lens. And since the grand bargain commitments in 2016, uh, what we've basically seen is this inertia. Right. Uh, yes, there's a moral case for localization, but at the same time, we then recognize that there are all these structural and systemic constraints that stand in the way of, of localization. Uh, I think the good news that I'm hoping at the very least that we can get out of this session is I think if we apply more and more peace building and conflict prevention approaches to the wider discourse on localization, I think we might get somewhere. And I know that that's a bit of a bold statement to make, and I'd be happy to hear the feedback from uh, from the colleagues that are on this uh, on this call. But if we could just get into uh, into the slides. Yeah, so I, I won't spend too much time on this one. You know, uh, I think uh, Michael just spoke about this, you know, uh, the fact that I think it's so critical to understand the local context, understand the social, cultural, the economic and the political dynamics that contribute to uh, to violence. Uh, but in the context of this uh, of this session, um, when we're speaking about, you know, access to data or data utility, you know, recognizing that local stakeholders, whether they're, you know, uh, local service providers, data research firms, whether they are, you know, local communities, think tanks, uh, governments and so on and so forth are not just partners in collecting and generating evidence, but are actually users uh, of, of, of this uh, of this analysis. And so my session today is to think through a demand and supply framework as we think about how could local stakeholders actually use uh, you know uh, data and evidence that we that we generate from conflict uh, assessments. Yeah, and so I think we're all familiar with the fact that USAID, as an example, you know, uses you know violence and conflict assessment information to guide uh, you know its design and its approaches to uh, you know uh, investments in the countries that it works in. Uh, this helps you know uh, the the mission identify root causes of violence and conflict. And so when we take a localized and participatory approach to analysis, uh, which I think both Michael and, and Shukri have spoken about, it allows USAID. Uh, to make sure that its programs are grounded in the needs and perspectives of local communities and stakeholders. And that's essentially what localization is about, right? Putting communities in the driving seat of both being able to highlight not just symptoms, but the root causes uh, of, 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 of conflict and instability, and then also coming up with, uh, with, with, with solutions. Now, that is the supply side. Um, to achieve true localization, we need to focus on similarly prioritizing and strengthening uh, the demand side. Now, what, what is the demand side? Uh, next, Sophie. Now, we need to imagine uh, a situation where local communities, and Michael touched on this uh, and, you know, quite eloquently, you know, we need to imagine a situation where local communities and stakeholders can use violence and conflict assessments to inform their own decision making. Um, and, and, and this is not just the assessment itself, but uh, this, this general practice of ensuring that conflict sensitivity uh, you know, uh, is, 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 is streamlined into how decisions are made, even within local governance uh, structures is so, uh, is so critical. Now, 
if we would, you know, uh, if we were, you know, deliberate and intentional about being able to share and disseminate these assessments, uh, we could have a situation where, you know, local organizations and community groups are better able to understand the dynamics of violence and conflict uh, in their area from a really objective uh, perspective, and to then identify opportunities for collaboration with USAID and other stakeholders. Now, when we speak about USAID's localization ambitions, we often speak about uh, two things. One is the direct funding targets, which are around 25%. But I would think that more importantly, is the 50% uh, target of, you know, being able to co-create new programs, uh, you know, with local stakeholders uh, uh, in the countries that the USAID works in. Now, by sharing some of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis and, ass and, and, and assessment, we can help local stakeholders to prioritize their own needs and initiatives uh, and participate in these co-creation uh, efforts uh, much more, uh, much more uh, effectively. Uh, next. So in order for these for the local stakeholders to be able to use this information, we need to then think through how are we packaging uh, this, uh, this this information uh, and and what does utility look like from uh, from the demand side now, we know that you know we've seen the evidence that when local stakeholders are involved in the analysis process, uh, uh, they're able to use the resulting information analysis to inform their own uh, decision making. Uh, but now to tie it into the even wider development uh, uh, ambitions, we now know that if we were able to improve the utility of uh, of, of you know uh, knowledge products such as you know conflict and and and, and violence uh, uh, assessment uh, products, then that we 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 we're able, we're likely to see a situation where there's more ownership. Of the resulting uh, interventions, and to make sure that these are implemented uh, uh, effectively, which then means that you know we don't stop at co-creation, but we actually entrench and enhance ownership throughout uh, throughout the, throughout the process. Now, I just want to say at this point that we are currently embarking on on, on a violence and conflict assessment uh, exercise in, uh, in 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 northern Kenya. Uh, where you know it's 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 quite uh, intricate, uh, you know, uh, and, and a really complex landscape, uh, especially when we're looking at an intersection between natural resource management, and uh, and, uh, and 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 conflict. And so it's going to be interesting. Uh, next, Sophie. As we think through how we improve the utility of this uh, of of, the, of this information. Um, there are necessary investments that need to happen in order to close that loop. So we see time and time again that. Yes, there's a robust participation and engagement uh, around the design of the tools, around the data collection. Uh, but now to think through, uh, you know, how do we make sure that local communities and stakeholders are not only involved in the design process, but also have access to the resulting analysis and knowledge products, and also making sure that these are packaged in a way that is uh, that is useful for them. So that is a challenge for us as we embark on this uh, on this exercise, and I'm hoping perhaps. Uh, in, 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 in a year from now, we're able to come back to this audience or, or, or a wider audience to report on what that experience uh, was like. Uh, next. Now, in order to be able to close the loop, we then have to recognize that we have to go, you know, we have to support investments that increase the utility of the violence and conflict assessment. And so this then becomes uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, an exercise that's focused on the outcome, but actually an investment in the process is so uh, is so is so uh, is so crucial. And I think just listening and other have others Columbia. lost. Sule oh, sorry, Suleiman. I think we lost you, but uh, I think you're back. Uh, yeah, so sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, we need to be thinking through what does it mean to support investments that increase the utility of the violence and conflict assessments. And the example that Michael just mentioned in Colombia, I think is a really uh, uh, good case study for uh, what would it take for a small, you know, uh, local entity to be able to uh, not just participate in, in, in data collection, but actually uh, package information in a way that has utility for community stakeholders. Uh, next. So uh, I was also asked to think through what are some of the limiting or enabling factors that improve uh, or you know stand in the way of 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 of, of you know the utility of uh, violence and conflict assessment and other knowledge products uh, that uh, that emanate out of this process. One, of course, is there is uh, you know an amount of trust building that needs to uh, that needs to happen. And in, we we recognize that this particular sensitivity, of course, around the subject of conflict prevention and peace building. Um, there is, you know, uh, thinking through duty of care, thinking through, uh, you know, neutrality and understanding what 
uh, you know, both explicit and implicit, implicit biases mean on the ground when we're engaging communities and community stakeholders. And so without trust building, then that trust deficit becomes a limiting, uh, a limiting uh, factor. Uh, the point that I spoke to about investments, um, of course, uh, you know, if there is no adequate capacity and there's no proper resourcing of local uh, stakeholders, and I think we need to create a dichotomy between funding and investments. Uh, funding usually looks at a really transactional uh, process where we are, you know, providing funds to a local stakeholder to deliver X amount of outputs for X amount of, uh, you know, uh, uh, dollars. Uh, however, investment is what we need to be looking at if we're able, to, if, if we're thinking of sustaining and, you know, truly entrenching localization as a way of, of, of doing things. And then we recognize that, you know, this kind of work takes uh, quite some time. Right, and so the timeliness of how we're able to put out these uh, these products is, is 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 so crucial. And when we're looking at a highly localized uh, context, then how do we tie, for example, in Kenya, uh, you know, an analysis of the elections uh, which, which, which just took place uh, to uh, you know when we disseminate uh, knowledge products and be able to even generate healthy discourse and debate before these important milestones that are happening uh, in these countries that we're that we're working in. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry again for the tech issues, uh, but I'll invite any questions. Great, thank you so much, Suleiman. Um, I think that was a really nice compliment to some of the other discussions um, we've had with, with Michael and Shukriya and the audience. Um, I wanna open it up to the audience, but I also wanna push you a little bit on this idea of, you know, packaging, packaging findings, um, putting things in the right format, reaching people at the right time and encouraging the, the demand side um, and the use of products. Um, you know, from your experiences, how have you seen that work well? Um, you know, how have you seen some of those sensitivities around information sharing, um, you know, that characterize, characterize a lot of this work that you mentioned um, be overcome? Um, I'm wondering, you know, are there success, success stories that we can, that we can draw from? I think we may have lost Suleiman due to due to connection, um, but I, I want to turn that question around to the audience a little bit around these ideas of you know making sure the the evidence we're collecting is also useful um, to the to all the participants uh, and the local stakeholders um, and using that as a tool for empowering them. You know, have people in the audience seen this done well, um, you know, what is the right format or is it always varied depending on the context? Go ahead, Joan. Um, yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I think Again, like, you know, there are, you know, we can talk about tools, but I think it's really about the approaches that, you know, and also the, the relationships that uh, our partners um, and the, the local community um, have with each other. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, like in my previous job with, you know, with American Friends Service Committee, one of the um, tools that we really embraced and adapted and, you know, and also tweaked a little bit to fit uh, what we needed um, with our partners and with the communities that we were working in uh, was uh, the most significant change story or just basically just, you know, collection of stories. And that really actually not only did um, local, you know, not only did um, community members participate, but they really embrace that as a tool to talk about, you know, to open up a space and to talk about the changes that that they've seen in their communities. Um, and one of the, you know, one one story that I can I can share is, you know, like we um, there was a one young woman in uh, El Salvador, young woman who we were speaking with about, you know, like what have you you know, asking her to, to tell her story. And she was, um, you know, she was saying that the space that we provided as a program, even though it was about conflict resolution, you know, and it was about youth leadership, 
to her, it was actually just a safe space where she can talk about issues that she cares about, like reproductive health. You know, it's something that she cannot really, that they cannot really talk about a lot in, in their context uh, because of, you know, the, the laws there against abortion, for example. Uh, and so, you know, she was telling us like the space that you provided me was it was safe. And that to me is peace building. So, you know, it, she gave us kind of like a food for thought of what it means to be to 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 build peace and what what the spaces that we provide mean for them. And it doesn't have to be the program itself, but the space itself actually that means more. Thank you, Joan. I think that's a really powerful example, you know, speaking to some of the questions that Suleiman was um, posing to the audience around, you know, how do we kind of engage people in a format that they like to engage or or feel creates the space for them to, you know, share share their experiences and stories. Um, Suleiman, I think you're you're back now. Um, we've been sort of looping back on this question of of utility and and um, closing the loop um, and how to do that effectively. Um, and you know, both to you, um, but also to the wider audience. You know, how do we how do we do this more effectively? What are some of the challenges and some of the practices and successes we've seen in the space? Um, yeah, Sophie, I, I apologize in advance if this is too simplistic of an answer, but one, one, you know, one example that comes to my mind is, you know, when we're designing, uh, you know, uh, the data collection tools, as we embark on, on an assessment, um, we, it's, it's rare that we think through, for example, I mean, an opportunity that we could leverage, for example, is to think through other specific questions that we might, you know, as, as, as a mission, uh, you know, or, or 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 an implementing partner might not be interested in, but perhaps you know our local implementing partners or our government counterparts might be interested in 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 finding out, right? So recognizing, for example, that government agencies or community groups or civil society groups might not have the resources to undertake you know these these extensive uh, assessments, but would be interested in you know including one or two questions, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in 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 a KAI tool, for example. I think is 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 which then means that you know they're invested in that process and. Would would like to see what the results were. Uh, it, with, 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 with the violence and conflict assessment exercise in Northern Kenya right now, for example, you know, there's 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 a quantitative and data science component, there's a GIS component. And uh, recognizing that these are not resources that often, you know, uh, local partners, you know, community stakeholders might have access to, um, how do we, you know, feed uh, you know, uh, some of their queries into, you know, or, or their lines of inquiry into this, uh, into this, into this approach that we are embarking on is, for example, an opportunity. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, um, one of the key aspects of participatory approaches can be like, you know, what does that mean exactly? What's the right level of engagement? And at what point, um, you know, we talk a little bit about sort of deep participation versus, um, you know, consultation being at a lighter end. Um, and I think one of the, one of the very real questions is, you know, how do we meaningfully um, engage along different points of the spectrum uh, of participation, given the, the context and, and who we're able to engage with um, in light of some of the, some of the constraints. Um, I'm conscious we're three minutes before um, the end of the session. Um, I want to invite any final questions for the panelists from the audience. We have time for just about um, one more and then I'll wrap up. Okay, great. If anything comes up during the wrap up, please do pop it in the chat. Um, I think this has been a really insightful session. Um, thank you so much to the panelists and, and to the participants um, who shared their experiences. Um, you know, to my mind, some of the key takeaways, um, you know, I think all three panelists and, um, you know, echo the importance of conducting uh, analysis that involves local stakeholders. Um, at the same time, we also reconfirmed some of the very real challenges. Um, we talked about 
the uh, extent to which nuance and, and context is critical, that there's no one size fits all approach. So how do we uh, you know, build an approach um, that we can use uh, for different contexts um, without sort of reinventing the wheel um, each time we, we go to do some of these exercises? Um, I think, you know, as well, just thinking back to Michael's presentation, um, there are success stories in the space. Um, there are tools that are, are being developed to do this. Um, and I think, um, you know, all of these approaches loop back to thinking through power structures, um, power imbalances between USAID implementing partners, local stakeholders, um, and that question of, uh, getting people, getting all the right people uh, in the room um, around a question, um, you know, uh, really thinking through um, what kind of participation is appropriate to bring together um, and, um, yeah, um, making sure that sort of reflects the dynamic um, in some of the communities in, in which we're working with, but also in a, in a sensitive um, and mindful way. Um, great. I think we're, we're just at about a time. I just want to thank everyone um, again for, for their participation. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has a really enjoyable rest of PeaceCon. Um, if anyone's interested in, in getting in touch, please do share your email in the chat. We'd be very happy to share a more detailed readout of the session uh, and follow up on some of the questions that were posed here today. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye.